medium. The episode that you are about to listen to is the second episode in a series of episodes covering Chris Bale's Breaking the Social Media Prism. While I will briefly recap some of the most relevant information at the beginning of this episode that we covered in the prior episode, I do recommend you listening to that prior episode if you are able to in order to have the best context for this particular episode. I normally try to write and record episodes that can be listened to by themselves without requiring context from other episodes, but that's going to be much more difficult to do when covering a book like this. If you dive into this episode and find that it's hard to track along or that you're missing some information, give the prior episode a spin and then just come back to this one later. When we last left off on Chris Bale's Breaking the Social Media Prism, we discussed how focusing on information and trying to understand political extremism, tribalism, and misinformation is the wrong place to start. Now, information is certainly important and part of the puzzle, but it's not the driving force behind these behaviors and the present state of our polarization in our society. Instead, Bale argues that there is something deeper driving political extremism and tribalism on social media, our identity. We ended the episode with Bale's thesis for the book, and it's worth restating here again just to set the tone for this episode. I will argue that our focus upon Silicon Valley obscures a much more unsettling truth. The root source of political tribalism on social media lies deep inside ourselves. We think of platforms like Facebook and Twitter as places where we can seek information or entertain ourselves for a few minutes. But in an era of growing social isolation, social media platforms have become one of the most important tools we use to understand ourselves and each other. We are addicted to social media not because it provides us with flashy eye candy or endless distractions, but because it helps us do something we humans are hardwired to do, present different versions of ourselves, observe what other people think of them, and revise our identities accordingly. But instead of a giant mirror that we can use to see our entire society, social media is more like a prism that refracts our identities, leaving us with a distorted understanding of each other and ourselves. Bale is concerned with approaching social media and polarization from the perspective of the everyday people who use social media, and not from the narrative of ex-Silicon Valley technologists and entrepreneurs who helped design the very technology and platforms that are now supposedly the root of all of our problems. Based on Bale's complex and in-depth work with his individuals that he worked with for several studies, Bale is convinced that the driving force behind social media polarization is a question of identity and not information. And I'm convinced that the theological angle here, one that Bale likely doesn't share or endorse, is that we are not primarily thinking things or brains on a stick, as James K.A. Smith likes to say, but that instead, we are driven by what we love. And not only do we not love what we think we love, we will do whatever it takes to get whatever it is that truly drives our habits and our behavior. God did not create us with our minds being the mission control of our entire being, but as embodied beings with hearts, minds, and bodies that are complexly united together to form an identity greater than the sum of these individual parts. What we love is driven by our identity, and our identity is more than just what we think or believe. It's what we want at the deepest parts of ourselves. To recap the experiment that set this all off, Bale and his team of researchers from Duke University conducted a study seeking to understand what drives the adoption of politically polarized beliefs and behaviors on social media, and to understand what role echo chambers play in that process. 
Common cultural wisdom suggests that people who get more polarized or radicalized in their political beliefs are caught in a self-reinforcing echo chamber system of uniform perspectives and opinions with little diversity or pushback. And that if people were to just step outside their echo chamber to get the other side, that it would hopefully result in people adopting more moderate in views and behaviors. However, the exact opposite happened. When the participants in Bale's study were exposed to the other side, it only reinforced their pre-existing political beliefs. And the more that they were involved and active on social media, the greater the hardening effect that it had. This effect was observed for both Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals, men and women, and held true across racial, geographical, and many other lines of data as well. Stepping outside the echo chamber, so to speak, did not result in people becoming more moderate in their views. It drove them to adopt stronger versions of their pre-existing political leanings. Bale contends that social media's worst effects are not in the presence of abundant misinformation and disinformation, although there is plenty of that to be found, and that is a problem worth addressing. Instead, Bale believes the biggest source of social media's worst effects are found in how it distorts our understanding of ourselves and distorts our understanding of each other. But in the quote that you heard a few minutes ago, I actually ended the thesis statement early. There's more to what Bale had to say. The social media prism fuels status-seeking extremists, mutes moderates who thinks there is little to be gained by discussing politics on social media, and leaves most of us with profound misgivings about those on the other side, and even the scope of polarization itself. The distorting effects of social media do not simply distort our view of one another. It distorts our understanding of how much distortion is going on at all. The consequences of these distortions are far from minor either. These threaten not just the peace and the purity of the church, but threaten the civic stability of American society as well. Initially, I had planned to cover chapters 4 through 6 of Breaking the Social Media Prism for this episode, but I'm going to split that section of the book into two episodes because I think it's worth discussing how social media distorts our image and the effects of that distortion separately. A couple months ago, I gave a presentation on Bale's book to the staff of the church that I work at, doing a very condensed version of the material that I wrote in my review of the book for Faith Tech. One of the questions that popped up was whether or not Bale's research, and specifically the distorting effects of the social media prism, apply to anything else besides politics. Do the distorting effects of social media apply to motherhood Instagram, or Reform Twitter, or Plastic Model Kit Reddit, or any of the other countless subgroups and cultures among Facebook, Snapchat, TikTok, YouTube, or any other social media platform. While I do want to caveat that not all internet subgroups are created equal, and that each platform may distort different things in different ways, Bale's research does generally apply to social media usage wholesale, not just to politics. To put it another way, it is not possible to use social media and not have your identity and your perception of the identities of others distorted in some way, because the source of these distortions is not based in the content of social media, but in the mediums themselves. In the first season of this podcast, I looked at how changes in technology and media lead us to change what we value because mediums are not value neutral. To reiterate Neil Postman, quote, A technology is merely a machine. A medium is the social and intellectual environment a machine creates, end quote. How a medium asks us to use it and engage with it reveals what that medium values, and we come to value what those mediums value the more we use it. As a society, 
uses a shared medium, society comes to value what that particular medium values and to have expectations and desires based on the expectations and desires of a dominant shared medium. Television, for example, values what Postman described as discourse via images. And a society discipled, so to speak, by television also came to value discourse through images. While this is an episode for another time, it should not surprise us at all that the long arc of social media bends towards video and that TikTok is rapidly ascending to the point Facebook, by the way, I refuse to call the company Meta, is desperately trying to pivot in that direction as well. TikTok and YouTube are extensions of television. Everything that television values, TikTok and YouTube values as well, but empowers to a greater degree. Truth, or an accurate or comprehensive portrayal of reality, is not something that any of these mediums have to value. Television values entertainment and production quality. If something happens to be true, that's just simply an added bonus, not a pre-request item. All mediums, even the printed word and books, are guilty of this to a degree, but some of these mediums bend in this direction more than others. All social mediums value content and engagement above all else. Whether or not that content or engagement is true or not is a bonus. In short, distorting reality is a feature of social media. It's not a bug. But how much of the conversation surrounding what exactly is distorted on social media and how to fix that distortion has been centered around the content of social media, specifically misinformation and disinformation? Like I talked about in the last episode, while misinformation and disinformation are things that absolutely need to be addressed in their own right, to focus specifically on information or content assumes the human person is fundamentally a thinking thing or a brain on a stick or that the mission control of the mind has received the wrong information and has now veered off course as a result. Lost in this discussion is the question of whether or not these mediums, by their very design, are driven towards distortion regardless of the truthfulness of its content. Also lost in this discussion, and hopefully we'll get some traction with Bale's work in his book, is the question of whether or not our minds and our intellect are the most serious things being distorted here. As Bale argues, The most severe impact of social media's distorting effects are not upon our intellects, but upon our identities, how we view ourselves and how we view others. As Christian philosopher James K.A. Smith has argued, we are not driven by what we think. We are driven by what we love, and what we love comes to shape our identity. And so if our identity is being distorted by social media, our loves are being distorted as well. My point in bringing this up at all is to say that I agree with Bale that focusing on misinformation as the primary cause of polarization and tribalism is not enough. We are driven by our identities, which is something much deeper and more comprehensive than simply what we think or what we believe. But while Bale focuses on political identity in his book, I actually think that his insight into social media as a prism that distorts and bends our identities extends to so much more than just our political identity or affiliation. I think it can apply to essentially anything. So for the rest of this episode, I want to focus on the two main ways that social media functions as a prism and how this applies not only to American politics, but also to American evangelicalism as well. After all, this is a podcast about how technology and media change the way we think about God and the way we love our neighbor. There are two primary distorting effects to talk about, distorting our identities and bending our identities. Now, that may sound like two different ways of saying the same thing, but I'll make that distinction between the two clear here shortly. Let's start with distorting our identities. Bale contends that much of the root cause of polarization and tribalism stems from two factors that result in 
a distorted understanding of ourselves and each other. Isolation and our tendency to misread our social environments. Let's start with isolation. This is the easiest one to grasp. When we live in isolation from one another, a relational distance between us naturally grows, and from that distance can often come misunderstanding, confusion, or other responses as we seek to fill in the gulf of relational information that we are missing. In the beginning of chapter 4 of the book, Bale tells the story of a social psychologist named Musafir Sharif, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, and two experiments he conducted in the 70s involving some young boys at a summer camp. Sharif took a group of campers who had never met each other and assigned each of them to an arbitrary team that they would belong to, thinking that by merely giving them a collective group identity, an us-versus-them mindset would arise and the two groups would begin to act with hostility towards each other. The first time he tried this experiment, it failed. But the second time he tried the experiment, it was a rousing success. As Bale describes it, the resulting carnage was eerily reminiscent of Lord of the Flies. What was the difference between these two experiments? In the first experiment, the boys were grouped into two different identities, but the two groups shared the same physical space. In the second experiment, the boys were grouped into two different identities, but this time the two groups were kept physically isolated and separated from one another as much as possible. The only times that the two groups saw each other was when it was time to eat and when the camp organizers brought them together to play team games. And it didn't take long for the group dynamics during the games to show back up in the dining hall later on. In the vacuum of relational isolation, something had to fill that space. And in the case of these boys, Bale notes that in isolation, their manufactured identity took on a life of its own as it filled that relational void. In the second experiment, one group of boys was called the Eagles and the other was named the Rattlers. Entirely arbitrary, entirely meaningless, entirely interchangeable identities. And yet, in isolation, both group of boys came to see these completely silly identities as being something that gave them a very deep sense of meaning and significance, not only for how they saw themselves, but for how they understood the other group. The ensuing in-group, out-group dynamic didn't need to be based on a philosophically robust or ethically rigorous system in order for it to become valuable and important enough for the two groups to see the other group as a threat to their existence and well-being. Even though, as the first experiment demonstrated, the boys were prone to harmonious cooperation when they weren't separated from one another. The implications are hopefully apparent here. If this antagonism and hostility could emerge from a group of boys at a summer camp with a silly arbitrary group identity, how much more antagonism and hostility could arise between two political parties who are becoming further and further isolated and walled off from engaging with each other? As political scientist Liliana Mason remarks, as quoted by Bale. Perhaps we should not be so surprised that political parties, armed with sophisticated campaigns, media professionals, and long periods of time to coordinate their activities, can create such deep-seated animosity between Republicans and Democrats if similar animosity can be created so easily with completely arbitrary identities such as eagles and rattlers. And if these same political parties are so effective at inflaming our passions, perhaps we should not be surprised that their power seems to increase when we find ourselves trapped within echo chambers, not unlike summer campers on opposite sides of a lake in rural Oklahoma. Now, just to be clear, I am not saying that American politics are as shallow as simply being called an eagle or a rattler at a summer camp. Obviously, there is much more to being a Republican or a Democrat than there is being named after an arbitrary animal in a sociology experiment. But if a collective identity and isolation was enough for the two groups of boys to grow unreasonably hostile to each other without being based on any ideology or conviction whatsoever, 
what kind of collective identity and isolation will result for two groups who are based on political convictions and political beliefs. Unlike the Eagles and the Rattlers, there are actually things at stake in the issues that Republicans and Democrats differ on. How big will the fire burn when the gasoline of isolation and group identity is poured on top of it? Now, there are entire episodes that could be done on the reality of isolation and how it is deeply connected to many of the problems we see in American culture today. Even before the pandemic occurred, American society was becoming increasingly buffered through the presence of screens and mediating technology getting in the way of our ability to interact in person with one another, especially with those who are different from us. One of the most critical things that our society is going to need to do if we are going to have any chance of reversing the trajectory that we are on is to learn how to have face-to-face dialogue with people that we disagree with. But at the same time, we shouldn't believe that reclaiming conversation and our ability to converse in person with people who are different than us will fix every problem or issue that we have because we are prone to misreading what people think about us, even in interpersonal contexts. According to Charles Horton Cooley, We develop our concept of self by watching how other people react to the different versions of ourselves that we present in social settings. This idea recasts identity not as a jersey we wear, but as the outcome of a complex process of social experimentation. We constantly present different versions of ourselves, observe which ones elicit positive reactions from others, and proceed accordingly. The problem, though, is that we are not always very good at evaluating what people actually think about us. And if we're not careful, we can get locked into behaviors and mindsets that become self-fulfilling prophecies based on what we think other people think about us, even if we have absolutely nothing to go on to justify those perceptions. And I'm just describing how this problem plays out in interpersonal communication. Naturally, when something as disembodied as social media enters the picture, the problem compounds even more. Not only do we have less information to go on, such as lacking body language, tone, or other interpersonal communication markers, we have the ability to construct a self-representation of ourselves that is carefully manicured and precise on a good day, and may not reflect who we actually are beyond the screen. This quote is lengthy, but I think it's necessary to quote it in full. In addition to giving us more control over our presentation of self, social media also allows us to monitor large parts of our social environment with unprecedented efficiency. Our news feeds, which provide frequent updates from everyone we follow, are not simply a convenient way of getting information about the issues we care about. They also enable us to make social comparisons with unprecedented scale and speed. A team of psychologists led by Aaron Vogel studied how frequently people make social comparisons on and off social media. The researchers found that people who use Facebook engage in far more frequent social comparisons than those who do not. In related research, the psychologist Claire Midley conducted a series of studies in which she observed people using Facebook. Midley also tracked the frequency of social comparisons people make, as well as who they compare themselves to and what effect this has on their self-esteem. She found that social media users tend to compare themselves to people who are more socially distant from themselves and also those who have higher status. After people make such upward comparisons, Midley discovered that most people experience decreased self-esteem. But what if decreased self-esteem wasn't the only thing that people experienced? What if those comparisons were based around political identity, and instead of decreased self-esteem, the result was an increase in misunderstanding about the people who are different than us, and different in ways that are bad or maybe even dangerous. I had mentioned earlier that the scope of this discussion would include more than just politics, and I think this is a good point to apply these insights to the current state of American Christianity, and specifically American evangelical Protestantism. Simply put, if 
Group identity and isolation are two ingredients necessary to having a distorted understanding of yourself and those around you. Then it's not hard to see how much of the fragmentation and infighting of American Protestantism is fueled by secondary or tertiary group identities that are relatively walled off from active dialogue and relationship with one another. Just to put all of my cards on the table. I consider myself both politically right of center, if all of my various stances were to be aggregated and averaged into one general location, and theologically reformed, specifically of the Calvinist tradition of the 16th century. I will be the first to admit that few corners of American Protestantism are more unhealthy right now than online reformed culture, especially as conveyed through social media. Just over the past Two or three years, I have had to distance myself from individuals that I used to align with theologically or looked up to as a role model because their character and their conduct descended into polarized, tribalistic madness. But in that, I need to give a pretty heavy caveat. My understanding of that unhealthy culture is a distorted or incomplete understanding of that culture. I'm only judging what I see because of the comparisons I make of others through social media. In fact, in my smaller and more personal offline reformed context, my evaluation is quite a bit different and significantly more positive. This isn't to say that my evaluation that some teachers, influencers, or institutions are dangerous isn't correct. It's just to say that my understanding of myself as someone who confesses Reformed theology in the classic Calvinist sense is likely going to be skewered heavily in a context of hundreds and thousands of other people who claim to confess Reformed theology, but my perception of what they actually believe and how they behave offline is heavily incomplete. And if I can't even reliably perceive my own status and identity among the theological tradition that I identify with, how much more so can I not reliably perceive my own status and identity among the myriad of other theological traditions within American Protestantism? How liberal am I compared to branches of Protestantism that are defined largely by commitments to conservative political convictions, even if I disagree with many of the features of current conservative Protestantism without identifying as a liberal? How conservative, or worse, am I compared to liberal and progressive branches of Protestantism for the same reasons? How complementarian or egalitarian am I actually when neither side accurately conveys my position and I draw from insights found on both sides? How woke am I simply because I believe that systemic institutional racism exists and that racial division remains a significant problem in American society and American Protestantism? If all I have to go by are the comparisons I make of myself to others on social media, I am going to conclude that hardly anyone else is like me and that I am relatively alone and isolated in what I believe compared to what I perceive others around me and what they may actually believe too. My inability to understand myself and my inability to understand myself relative to others creates this vicious feedback loop of increasing perceived alienation and separation from those that I think are radically different than I am, but who in reality may not be as different from me as social media leads me to think that they are. Could it be that much of the infighting among American Protestants today are based on an artificially generated misunderstanding of what we actually believe beyond the labels that provide convenient shorthand for us to avoid having to do the work to get to know people that may see things differently than we do? This is where the second distorting effect of social media enters in. Social media does not simply distort our identities. It bends our behaviors towards those distortions of those identities. At the core of our identities is a desire for significance and status. We want to build our understanding of ourselves around things that matter to us. If we highly value marriage, we will not simply desire just to be married, but to have the best marriage possible. 
If we highly value our jobs or professions, we will gladly work ourselves to the bone to be able to say that we are the best at what we do. If we highly value the success of our children, whether in academics, sports, or some other metric of success, we will orient our entire lives around making sure one particular aspect of our child's life is as successful as possible. But even deeper than that, if we desire to belong to a group of people that embodies something that we value and prize, and if we desire the approval and the acceptance of that group of people, we will adopt whatever behavior is necessary for that group of people to consider us one of them, even if that is based on a distorted understanding of what that particular group believes or desires of its adherents. In short, if we want those we respect and revere to consider us one of them, we will often do whatever it takes to get their approval, even if it requires beliefs or behaviors that we would never otherwise hold to or do on our own. Bale's description of social media as a prism, where our identities are distorted and bent, is more than simply a funhouse mirror at a carnival. Take, for example, a funhouse mirror that gives you giant outsized legs. You walk up to it and behold, suddenly you have the thickest legs of any human on the planet. It's amusing for a bit, but you walk away exactly the same way that you came in, knowing that your legs aren't actually any larger than they were when you walked into the room. But, as Bale said in the thesis statement for this book, social media is not a giant mirror that we can use to see society as a whole. Instead, social media does something more to us beyond giving us a potentially amusing distortion of ourselves. It actually changes the way that we behave towards one another. Social media is more than simply a funhouse mirror. With a funhouse mirror, you observe that you have massive legs, but you walk away with your normal sense of how to walk that you've had your whole life. With social media, you observe that you have massive legs, and then you walk away from the mirror convinced that you actually have massive legs and that you need to walk as though these are how your legs actually look and need to operate with these giant sweeping steps that are foreign and unnatural to how you've understood yourself and experienced your legs up until then. Saying that social media distorts and bends our identities could be seen as two ways of saying the same thing, but Bale suggests, and I agree with him, that the distortion of social media changes our perception of ourselves and others and then bends our identities to conform or respond to those distortions that we perceive. It's not simply a question of knowledge or belief. Social media fundamentally changes our behavior, and it changes our behavior to correspond to the identity that we desire to have based on the identities we perceive of others. Identities that are likely very distorted and incomplete. And if I perceive that those that are the opposite of me politically not just simply believe different things than I do, but that they are actively working against my safety and well-being and the safety and well-being of my loved ones, that's not simply going to change how I perceive the other group, but how I respond to them as well. And to be clear, this isn't to say that there isn't a basis for truth in some of those reactions. In the ordinary course of American politics and politics in general, there will be winners and losers who gain and lose advantage and privilege, especially in a democratic republic like America. Sometimes those wins and losses are insignificant and made to be a bigger deal than they are, but sometimes those wins and losses are legitimate and severe and can be felt very deeply. I'm not trying to flatten out every single political issue into being one of equal measure or value because I certainly don't believe that's true. My general point is that if my default operating position is to assume that the other side relative to where I am has the worst possible intentions and motivations against me, I should assume 
the worst possible intentions and motivation against them. And assuming that they will stop at nothing to achieve their goal of harming me and those I care about, I need to respond with a similar degree of intensity as well. And furthermore, if I believe that my side is righteous, that is, if God or science or the people whose opinion I value the most approves of my belief and of my behavior, then it's simply not a matter of survival, but one of moral duty to do whatever I can to make sure that the Rattlers or the Eagles or the Republicans or the Democrats or the complementarians, or the egalitarians, or the woke, or the anti-CRT, never gain an inch of territory anywhere, ever. But compounding this problem even further is the fact that not only does social media bend us toward the direction of the distortion, but that the distortion doesn't amplify the presence or the voice of the ordinary and everyday people of a particular group, but only the loudest individuals of that particular group and the most extreme views within that particular group. The bend in our behavior is towards the direction of the more extreme views and the more extreme behavior, which is exactly what Bill and his research team concluded in their studies and what we focused on in the previous episode. Exposing other people to the other side of a viewpoint did not result in more moderate beliefs and behaviors, but more extreme beliefs and behaviors. Even though, as Bale documents, these extreme beliefs and these extreme behaviors represent the small minority of any particular group or position. And when the leaders of a group of people move in those extreme directions, it takes with them the people who lead that group or model that identity that gives them status that they value. It doesn't take much imagination to see how this has happened to both the Republican and the Democratic Party over these past six years, with the Republican Party moving in whatever direction Donald Trump goes and the Democratic Party doubling down on the progressive wing of its party, even as it continues to cost them elections. If being a Republican or a Democrat is the biblical thing to do or the morally right thing to do, you will move in whatever direction the party goes even if it takes you to places you never thought you would go yourself. I had mentioned at the onset that I was going to take what was going to be one episode and split it into two parts, because I want to give an entire episode to the consequences of how social media distorts our politics and the implications it has for us, because the consequences are not minor or insignificant. And I'm going to end this episode on an incomplete point, but not without offering some encouragement or perspective for what I've covered in this episode. If social media distorts our identities and bends our behavior, is it possible to correct those distortions and our behavior? I would say that yes, it is. Social media may not be a giant mirror that we can use to see ourselves relative to society, but there does exist a mirror that is able to show us who we truly are and give a correct understanding of ourselves relative to the world. And that is the word of God. As James 1, through 25 says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have received an identity that is greater than any identity we could have in this life. All of the other identities that we may build our lives around will fade away, but our identity in Christ will last for eternity. We receive the identity of being adopted into the family of God as being chosen, loved, justified, sanctified, and one day glorified. And in this identity, our goal is not to become the perfect conservative or liberal father or mother, husband or wife, or to make any other sum set of who I am the sum total of my being. In this new identity, the goal is to become like Christ. And in becoming like Christ, I will desire what Christ desires and behave 
as Christ behaves. Through the Word of God, the Spirit corrects our identities and our understanding of ourselves and supernaturally empowers us to live in accordance with this new identity that we have in being conformed to Jesus Christ. Even though the church and Christians today are rampantly plagued by these distorting and bending effects of social media, the fact remains that the church is uniquely positioned and empowered to offer something divinely powerful and able to help those caught in the whirlwind of the social media prism, even if it's the people in its own pews. The church does not simply have to take it when it comes to social media's distortions on ourselves and society. We have something that we didn't create but received by the grace of God that is able to directly confront this situation in a meaningful way. But what exactly are we facing here? On the next episode of Breaking the Digital Spell, we will examine the consequences of the social media prism on society and how we can respond to the muting of moderates and the amplification of extremism. Thank you for listening to this episode of Breaking the Digital Spell, and I hope this episode convinces you not only to subscribe to the podcast for the next episode in this series, which is going to release in January of 2022, but to pick up a copy of Breaking the Social Media Prism as well. And if you have any book lovers in your family, and if you're looking for a good book to get them for Christmas, I promise you cannot go wrong with this book. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider leaving a one-time tip over at our Buy Me a Coffee page or become a member to keep supporting the work of this podcast. You can find a link to our Buy Me a Coffee page in the show notes of this episode or by visiting buymeacoffee.com forward slash digital spell. Breaking the Digital Spell is written and produced by me, Austin Gravely, with production assistance from Andrew Akins. Quotes are read by my wife, Melissa Gravely. You can follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and you can listen to this episode and all of our prior episodes on our YouTube page or anywhere else you get your podcasts. And please consider leaving an iTunes review or a review wherever you're listening to this if this podcast has been helpful to you so that others can discover it and listen to it as well. You can reach out to me directly with questions or comments through any of our social media platforms or through sending an email to breakingthedigitalspell at gmail.com. My name is Austin, and together we are Breaking the Digital Spell.